Lord, we come before you tonight and we ask for the Holy Spirit to reveal Yeshua HaMashiach and make his presence known to us tonight, that there would be a holy fear. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of salvation. Proverbs 1, 7. And where there's no fear of God, an evil deceit enters the picture. And we see this in chapter 5 of Acts. A man and his wife are deceiving and trying to lie to the Holy Spirit. And they're pretending to be religious regarding something that is really an evil thing. And I guess the love of money is the beginning of all kinds of wickedness. And as long as the man had the material, the, the gift that he was giving, the land, it was his to do with whatever he wanted. But when he said publicly that he was giving the entire amount and then this amount at the feet of the apostles, but held back a certain amount, making it in a kind of an embezzlement, as if he had reached into the offering plate and actually stolen money that had belonged to God. And because he was putting up a show and putting the Holy Spirit to the test and lying, and because this deceitful spirit was entering the new kehila to possibly open the door for more wickedness, a certain show of force was necessary. And the Holy Spirit struck him dead. This was like the man that reached out and touched the ark. It was a show of force intended to bring holy fear upon the whole group, which it did. When his wife came into the sanctuary there, she was also privy to this deception and was willing to lie and put the Holy Spirit to the test. So here you have two Orthodox Jews getting quick Orthodox burials. The uh, Takrahim is put over them immediately and they're carried out and buried immediately. And it says great fear fell upon the house of God. And Lord, what I'm asking tonight is that you would put great fear upon me because the fear of the Lord is protection for me and for everyone else. We do things that we regret later, things that have bad consequences and a ripple effect that go out. And it's all because we don't have sufficient fear of God. And Lord, we need that fear of God. We need it tonight, right now, on this day. We ask you to pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and give us that holy fear that we would recognize the Holy Spirit's presence at all times, that we would walk in the light as he is in the light, that we would speak as if he were listening, which he is, that we would carry on our business, not uh, with a hypocritical double life, but walking in the spirit of God. And oh Lord, we thank you for this passage that you've given. And we thank you, Lord, that we can meditate upon it. It says, now a certain man by the name of Ananias 
together with his wife. They were sort of a Bonnie and Clyde uh, criminal element. And they were coming into the house of God and they weren't right spiritually. They did not have sufficient fear and reverence. And God was not gonna tolerate that and he wasn't going to allow it to create a precedent and get more Ananiases and more Sapphiras. So it says they sold a piece of property. Now the thing is this property was his. He didn't have to put it in the offering plate. He didn't have to do any of this, but he did offer it up. But when he put it in the offering plate, so to speak, he lied and embezzled the funds. And he kept some of the proceeds for himself his wife also being aware of this. And oh God, this was a test. Were the, were the believers going to walk in transparency toward God? Or were they going to live a double life, a hypocritical life? And put the Lord to the test. Will I be found out? Can I sow evil? and mock God and get away with it. The Bible says, whatever you sow, you shall also reap, for God is not mocked. And they're trying to mock God in this sense. And uh, they brought along a certain portion of it, but they kept back a certain portion. And they pocketed it. Now, if you say, look, all of this is the Lord's, but then you pocket some of it, you're, it's like, it's like a, a treasurer embezzling funds from the actual account of the house of God. And so they placed it at the feet of the apostles. But you know, Kepha or Kepha, Peter said in the Holy Spirit, Ananias, why did the devil, why did Satan, why did the accuser so fill your heart? His heart was filled with, with the devil, like Judas Iscariot. This is very, very fearful thing. We should keep our, it says above all, guard your heart because out of the heart are the issues of life. We should guard our heart. We should realize that the devil, the accuser of the brethren, wants a toehold in our hearts. He could do great uh, sin, uh, he can do great temptation and cause great sin if he can somehow scratch his way into a believer's heart. And so in the same way that Judas Iscariot's heart was filled by the devil, so Ananias, his heart was also filled by, with the devil. And just as Judas Iscariot found this to be a lethal situation for him. You know, when you turn yourself over to the devil, you very well will pay the price. And here we see he's going to pay a price. Because when the devil fills your heart that you lie, he didn't lie to men. He lied to the Holy Spirit. And uh, when you when you lie to men, 
that's one thing. But when you lie to the Holy Spirit, that is something else. And so he lied. And he lied to the Holy One, the Holy Spirit. And he was keeping some of the proceeds for the land for himself. And how did Kipa know this? He knew it because of a word of knowledge. He was operating in the spirit. The Lord showed him this. And the, the Lord also showed him the penalty for this. My friend, if you could see the penalty for your sins, you would repent of your sins. Ananias had a blindness here, but Kepa did not have that blindness. And the reader, uh, and Luke wants the reader to see this. He wants Theophilus to see this. He wants you to see this. That it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. And he wants you to see that you cannot lie to the Holy Spirit. And you cannot keep back something and the Holy Spirit not know that you're doing it. In other words, you cannot pull the blind down and do something in the dark that the Holy Spirit is unaware of. You, you cannot evade the eye of the Holy Spirit. He had the impression that, look, nobody was there when he took the money and put it somewhere. Just like Achan. Achan was in his tent. He had the money under his bed or something. Uh, it wasn't just money. It was uh, various things that were uh, harem, and they were uh, booty that was uh, to be destroyed and not to be uh, uh, not to be put aside for your own personal use. And suddenly there was defeat in the camp. And then the Holy Spirit spoke to Joshua, just like the Holy Spirit spoke to Peter. Here we see the camp of the Lord has a supernatural headship. The Ruach HaKodesh is in operation in the house of God. And so all of these people, there were, what, 600,000 people. They had to be set aside by tribes, by clans, by families, and they got down to one family, and then it got down to Achan himself and his uh, immediate uh, children and wife, etc. And then he was brought forward, and the spotlight was on him. And why did you do this, Achan? Uh, Joshua asked him, "What? What's? Why didn't you know that you were going to be caught? You cannot." You cannot evade God's eye. He sees everything. God is omniscient. Lord, I want to pray and ask forgiveness for all of us. A revival begins when people get the fear of God, get on their face and ask God to forgive them, that they might walk in transparency. Because we don't want an Ahan situation. We don't want an Ananias situation. We don't want a Sapphira situation. Notice there was plenty of cause for the women in the early Kehillah to get scared. If this happened to Sapphira, it could happen to them. There was plenty of reason for the men in the early Kehillah to get scared. If this could happen to Ananias, it could happen to them. Notice God wants both the men and the women to come into this fear the fear of the Lord, the Yeras Hashem, which is the beginning of salvation wisdom. And so when Peter asks him this question, why did the accuser, the devil, Hasatan, 
Why did he so fill your heart that you lie, not to men, but to the Ruach HaKodesh? And you say you're giving all of the money, but you're holding back some of it. So you're not giving all of the money. So you're lying. And then he says, so long as it remained unsold, and so long as it was yours, you hadn't sold it or pledged it, did it not belong to you? Could you not do with it what you wanted? You didn't have to lie. It was not necessary to lie. You could do whatever you wanted to. You could have said, I'm going to sell this and I'm going to give half of the funds for the Lord's work. Or you could have said, I'm going to sell this and I'm going to give uh, a quarter of the funds to the Lord's work. Or you could have said anything, but no. You wanted the praise of men. You wanted everyone to say, oh, look what he's done. He sold everything he had. And now he's giving it to God. Isn't that wonderful? And you thought you could get the praise of men. Listen, friend, the fear of man brings a snare, but the fear of God brings salvation. Very often we are afraid of men, but we're not afraid of God. And that is a big problem here. And that's what Ananias had mixed up. He wanted the praise of men, but he did not have the fear of God. And so it says, and once sold, was it not in your power, under your authority to do with whatever you wanted to? Why was such a deed put into your heart? Why, why would you even think of doing something this wicked? To lie to the Holy Spirit. To lie to the Holy Spirit. Lord, we want to come before you tonight. We want to ask that we would have the right relationship with the Holy Spirit, a relationship of transparency. The Holy Spirit is our helper. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. The Holy Spirit brings us to the Messiah. The Holy Spirit lifts up the Savior, the Goel Redeemer. The Holy Spirit brings us to salvation. The last thing we want to do is grieve the Holy Spirit or insult the Holy Spirit or lie to the Holy Spirit. And during the ministry of Yeshua on this earth, there were people who insulted the Holy Spirit by saying that he did his healings by the power of Satan, calling the Holy Spirit Satan. And they were warned that if you go too far here, you could really shoot yourself in the foot because if the Holy Spirit is the one to woo you and bring the tears of repentance and bring you to salvation and you insult the Holy Spirit and drive him away, never to return, then this will definitely have an impact on your salvation. It is the unforgivable sin. It's the sin. Uh, it's, it's a sin that is a mortal sin that cannot be forgiven. It is the sin of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And Johannes says, I don't, I don't ask you to pray for someone who has done that. I'm not asking you to pray for that. That sin, prayer won't help because that is an unforgivable final sin. And this was what Yeshua faced when he did these great miracles and he had people come and try to tear down his miracle by blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And here you have someone who is lying to the Holy Spirit in order to get the praise of men, but under the cloak of covetousness, wanting money and not realizing that filthy lucre and the love of it 
is the beginning of all kinds of sin. And this sin, which was trying to get its foot in the door in the early Kehillah, God was putting his foot down right here. And he was saying this far and no further. So when Kipa said, why was such a deed put into your heart? You did not lie to men, but to God. Lord, I pray that we would have a, a deeper fear and reverence of God, of God himself. That, that, that God is a companion who walks with us. Uh, we are believers. We've come to salvation. And so, in a way, the fall has been reversed because there was fellowship in Gan Eden. And when, when, the, when God came in the cool of the evening, this fellowship was disrupted because the man had gone into hiding and covered himself and God had to ask him where are you Adam and he 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 was naked and uh, God had to ask him well who told you that you were naked how do you even know this where did you get this knowledge a certain knowledge of good and evil a certain knowledge that is a, uh, an evil kind of thing that has happened and you're changed and our fellowship has been disrupted. Lord, we're asking tonight in this prayer meeting that our fellowship with, with God would not be disrupted by lying to the Holy Spirit. That our fellowship with God would not be disrupted because of any uh, covetousness uh, that leads us to lie to the Holy Spirit or to have a double life or to do certain things as if God were not watching. Oh Lord, we see the eye of God upon us 24-7, 365. We are never outside his hearing range. We are never outside his vision range. He always hears and he always sees what we say and even our thoughts. That's why we pray, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my Redeemer, because we see from the scriptures that God is not mocked. We cannot mock him. We cannot hide from his presence. We cannot do one thing in his presence and then think that perhaps he didn't see us and we can get away with it. Lord, I ask you to put a holy fear upon us tonight because salvation begins with the fear of the Lord. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of salvation. And this guy, Ananias, who had taken the mikvah and seemed to be moving in the uh, direction of salvation, apparently did not have sufficient fear. And the Lord knows those who are his, but I, I, I don't get the impression that he was a real believer. Oh God, keep us, keep us from this. Uh, we, we, when, we, when we read this story, we tremble because we see that, that uh, the ambulance could come for any one of us at any time. We're only a heartbeat away from your presence. And I pray, dear God, that we would take heed 
and that you would give us a healthy dose of the fear of God. And so hearing these words, Ananias fell down and yielded up his soul. No one pushed him. No one did anything to him. His heart stopped and he died. And I pray, Lord, that our hearts will tremble when we read this story and that we will have a new fear of God to protect us because this is who we're dealing with, a holy God. Then it says, great fear came upon all who heard of it. And there was, a, there was a need for this fear because all the needy people were getting their needs met. The rich people were selling their property and putting the money at the feet of the shalakim. Uh, anybody who was poor had plenty to eat, plenty to, uh, you know, as far as clothing, they had no need of being naked or hungry. Everything was going well. And sometimes when things are going well for you, the fear of the Lord evaporates. Sometimes it's not really healthy for us to have everything going so well. Because when that happens, we can forget God. And friend, they needed to remember that the great God who will sit on the great white throne and judge the living and the dead had offered up his son and his son had paid a terrible price to make the kapora so that they could be saved and they could not cheapen his sacrifice by living in a careless way. And so a, there was a need for fear. You say, are you saying that Ananias and his wife were scapegoated? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that this is what God did. He produced this fear. And he let everyone know that repentance involves transparency. It is not something that you just make a public show. You go to the front, you, you give some kind of gift, you let everybody know how religious you are, you do teshuvah, and uh, everything seems to be just fine, except it's not real, and you're living a double life, and this is going on. The Lord didn't want anything of the kind. He, he put his foot down immediately when this started to happen. And so on hearing these words, Ananias fell down and yielded up his soul and great fear came over all who heard of it. And then it says the young men stood up. They seemed to know that their muscular strength was needed to be the pallbearers. And they had a shroud. They put the takrahim on the body. And he was given a quick Orthodox Jewish burial. They carried him out and they buried him. Now, there was an interval of time. Obviously, Luke got this story either from Kepha himself or from someone who was an eyewitness because you have these details. <coughs> Excuse me. There was an interval of time. About three hours elapsed. So if this happened at one o'clock, it was around four o'clock when his wife showed up. Now, she didn't know about any of this. Notice God knew about it. God showed Peter about it before it happened. Peter had a word of knowledge. 
but she was totally in the dark. And she had not repented. And she was also willing to put the Holy Spirit to the test. Oh God, oh God, I pray right now in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach that I will not put the Holy Spirit to the test. That no one listening to this video will put the Holy Spirit to the test. That we will realize that it is impossible to mock God. He knows everything. He sees everything. He cannot be put to the test except to see if he will actually do something. And if he does, that is bad news for you. And it was very bad news for this woman because she entered the picture completely in the dark. There was an interval of about three hours. And then his wife, not knowing what had happened, not knowing that she was a widow, not knowing that this evil scheme had been found out by the prophet. You know, David was not able to hide his evil scheme from the prophet Nathan. He had done what he thought was the perfect crime. One thing led to another. He, he tried to fix it by uh, sending Uriah back to his wife, but his, wa his, his wife uh, couldn't get Uriah back because Uriah was a holy soldier and he was in campaign and the, the, the soldiers were celibate during these, uh, these sores. And so he refused to do this. And even though David got him drunk, David could not get this to happen. So from David's point of view, in order to, to, to sweep the crime under the rug, he had to tell his general, put him somewhere where he's gonna get killed. And he did it. And it looked like it, he was gonna get away with it because the only people that knew about this apparently was Bathsheba, if she even knew and David, and Joab, his general. And no one else seemed to know about it. But my friend, God knew about it. And God told the prophet. Now, when you're in a congregation, and the congregation is filled with people with the Ruach HaKodesh, filled with the Ruach HaKodesh, and the gifts of the spirit are in operation and there are prophets and there are people that have the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom who operate in the spirit, uh, like a seer, you know, uh, who can tell you where your donkeys are, if, they're, if you've lost your donkeys or whatever it is. You cannot get away with these things. And the reason you cannot quench the spirit, forbid speaking in tongues, or uh, uh, despise prophesying is you need this because there are times when a prophet has to confront you and you have to repent because some secret sin has entered your heart and you're trying to live a double life and it has to be stopped and it has to be stopped immediately for your sake. So this woman, not knowing that she had just become a widow, that she had been a widow for three hours without even knowing it, and not knowing what had happened, and not knowing that the Lord was breaking up this little scheme of hers with her husband's, and, and that the Lord was not going to allow this hypocrisy and this deceit and this lying to the Holy Spirit and this uh, looking for the praise of men and uh, loving money and having a covetous spirit regarding filthy lucre and putting on a pose in front of everyone else. Oh, look at this wonderful woman. She's given this 
big piece of property. She gave the whole thing. And she, she and her husband put the money at the apostles' feet. And uh, so here we have this problem. Uh, we have Sapphira finding out that God is not mocked. And we're looking at Acts chapter 5, verse 6, where the young men rose up, put the takrahim on the body, and carried him out as pallbearers, and buried him. He gave him a quick Orthodox Jewish burial. Then an interval of about, of about three hours elapsed, and his wife, not knowing what had happened, not knowing that she had become a widow woman, not knowing that he had been exposed, not knowing that the wages of sin is death and that he had literally died. He had died right there. Nobody killed him. The Holy Spirit made an example out of him and he died right on the spot. And, and, the, and Sapphira, not knowing this, she came in and Peter spoke aloud to her. He said, tell me whether you sold the land for such and such a price. And you know what? She lied. Right there, she lied. She didn't just lie to Peter. She lied to the Holy Spirit. She lied to God. She lied in the house of God, in front of the people of God, to the Holy Spirit of God. Because she had not sold the land for that amount. She had sold it for more, and they had pocketed it in a deception to get the praise of men as if they had sold it for that amount. But as a matter of fact, it was, it was the fact that she had, and her husband had, uh, conspired together to keep some of the money and embezzle basically funds that had been turned over to the house of God. And so she did not tell the truth. She actually went along with her husband. Now, you know, there are women that say, you know, I would like to serve the Lord, I would like to be a believer. I would like to go to the house of God and do what the other believers do. But you know what? I have to. I have to obey my husband. I have to go along with my husband. Uh, instead of saying, you know, Moshiach Ben Dovid is my husband, and I've got to go along with him. Yes, I need to respect my husband and honor my husband. But if he tells me to do something that is unscriptural. I have to obey the, the Mashiach Ben Dovid. Instead of doing that, many women make this mistake, the mistake that Sapphira made, because she went along with her husband and she what? lied. Uh, her husband had lied. She lied. And, and you know, friend, uh, you got you to watch that because uh, if you lie, you're, you, you, you're, you're getting yourself in trouble. They had already embezzled and stolen. Now they're lying. And Peter said to her, why was it agreed between you to try to, try to put to the test the spirit of the Lord? You see, this was something that was being done in front of the whole congregation and, and the whole congregation was watching. And if God's spirit could be put to the test and God would not do anything, then the rest of the people might say, well, you know what? I think I'm going to get it. I'm going to try to get away with a few things because uh, look, I didn't do anything to her. And apparently God can be mocked. So why not? Why not mock the Lord? Uh, I could put the Lord to the test too. And so that's what's happening here. And Kipa is operating in the Holy Spirit. 
and the Holy Spirit is giving him a word of knowledge that both of these individuals are going to be made, uh, uh, they're going to be made an example out of. And so he says, why was it agreed between you to try the spirit of the Lord? Look at the door, the feet of those Paul bearers who have buried your husband. They are there to carry you out also. And I don't even know that she had a chance to even turn around and look because she immediately and at once fell down at his feet and yielded up her soul. And the pallbearers, these young pallbearers came in, they found her dead, they carried her out, they buried her beside her husband. And great fear came over the entire assembly and over everyone hearing of these things. Now, some people say, well, you know, I believe they were believers and they went to heaven. Uh, and you know what? We're not really, we don't really go to hell for things that we do. It's for rejecting the Messiah. And because they didn't verbally re reject Yeshua, uh, I don't really think they went to hell. Well, the problem with that is, if they went to heaven, why did this great fear come over the entire assembly? It wasn't just a little fear, my friend. It was great fear. I mean, there had been 3,000 people come to the Lord in the very first day that the gospel was preached so we're talking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people in Jerusalem and we're we're saying that great fear came upon those hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people now if they went to hell that would explain the great fear of course the Lord knows those who are his but I don't see any warrant here in assuming, oh yeah, they, they went to heaven and lived happily ever after. It's as if they weren't really saved. It's as if they were intruders who came in and uh, were trying to masquerade as believers, but they had not repented. The first thing I have to do, my friend, is repent. I have to repent tonight. You need to repent. If Ananias and Sapphira died because they didn't repent, it's a serious thing not to repent. Regardless of what you think about heaven and hell, it's a serious thing. Uh, they died. The pallbearers carried their bodies out and buried them. Why? Because they didn't repent. Ananias had a chance to repent. He could have said to Kepha, you know, I did a terrible thing. And I want to make it right right now. I want to repent. I want to tell you, here's the exact amount that I uh, was paid. And I want to give the whole thing as I had pledged for the Lord's work. And I want nothing to do with filthy lucre. And I'm certainly not going to try to deceive anybody by pocketing money that belongs to God. I'm not going to steal from the offering plate. So I want to ask God to forgive me now, Peter. He could have done that. But instead, he did not repent. Unless you repent, you will all alike perish. In other words, don't say you're going to heaven. You're going to perish just like those other people who are going to hell. Listen, I'm preaching a very hard gospel tonight. Why am I doing this? Because the Lord wants you to repent. He wants you to realize how important it is to repent. Repentance is not optional. 
And, and this man could have saved his own life if he had repented, but he didn't, and neither did his wife. And Lord, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. And we don't want to fall into it, the hands of an angry God. We want to repent because God will forgive us if we repent. Lord, I want to repent of all my sins tonight. I can't have an Azusa Street revival if I haven't repented. If my heart is an Ananias heart or a Sapphira heart, if I have, if I have no fear of God and if I have secret sin and if I'm living a double life and if I'm trying to put God to the test and if I'm, if I'm lying to the Holy Spirit and if I'm putting on a, a show of religion but I'm not really a believer, not really, I haven't repented, I haven't asked God to forgive me and I haven't come clean with the Lord then uh, I'm, I'm walking on ice and we see this man fall through the ice and it, it, he may have fallen through the, uh, actually into hell fire. It's possible. And also his wife. Uh, you do get the impression that whatever happened to them was very scary. Now, if someone dies and goes to heaven, I don't see anything scary about that. My mother was a believer and uh, when she died, I wasn't afraid. I was, I was sad. I was sad that she had died and I knew I was going to miss her. And she had played a big part in my salvation. She had preached to me for so many years. And uh, it meant a lot to me to know that she went to heaven. Because I knew that she went to heaven, I didn't have any kind of fear. It says great fear. Great fear, not fear, but great fear fell, up, fell over the entire assembly. We're talking hundreds of people, hundreds and hundreds of people shaking in their boots with fear. That doesn't sound to me like somebody like my mother going to heaven. Um, and uh, everyone who heard about these things was, was afraid. So why would... Why would Luke include this story in, in, the, in the history of the early Kehillah? Why does he include it? There are a lot of things that happen that he just doesn't include, but he includes this. Why? Apparently, he's wanting us to know that repentance is absolutely important. And that in the early Kehillah, before the false teachers started showing up, and we're going to see one of those in chapter 8. Before the uh, enemies of the gospel started throwing people in prison and uh, fighting the spread of the good news throughout the entire world, as uh, Paul and Silas and others found out later, that when they went to the mikvah, the mikvah mayim, to have the mikvah toivalen teshuvah, there was a real repentance. And in the case of Ananias and Sapphira, where there wasn't a real repentance, there was a great fear generated among the others when they saw the obverse. In other words, what happens when somebody doesn't repent and puts on a fine show in the house of God? Well, this is what happens. And when this happens, it's scary. And it brings everybody to their senses. And it says in Proverbs 1-7, great fear it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of salvation. And Luke is wanting to show what salvation looks like. And he's wanting to show what salvation amounted to in the early Kehillah. Yes, they didn't care about money anymore. They cared about getting the gospel out. They cared about the poor. They shared what they had. And when someone who loved filthy lucre tried to lie and do a sham repentance and a sham conversion, 
they were found out by the Lord and his prophet, just like Achan was found out. And so this brought great fear upon the house of God and everyone made a real teshuvah. And that's what I want to do tonight, Lord. And I, I know that the people watching this video want to do that. And I know that that's what's involved in teshuvah. It's not just coming back to Judaism. Uh, it's not just uh, showing up at the shul uh, and uh, being with the Bokarim again. You know, you had your drugs and your drug buddies. Now you're back at the shul. You're making teshuvah. No, it's more than that, friend. It is a heart turning to God and a fear of the Lord. And that's what we want, Lord. And I'm going to pray right now that somebody will say to the Lord tonight, Father, forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me for my double life. Oh, God, I want to live a transparent life before you. And I want to walk in your presence at all times. And I don't want to ever try to pull the shade down and live a double life or a different type of life when no one is watching. Because you are watching, Lord, and I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, ignite your fury and your fire against me. Because I fear you, Lord, I fear your name. And so, if you will, uh, just keep what I've said in mind and uh, open your Bible to Proverbs, I'm sorry, Psalm 51. What I want to do here just for a moment is repent using this, with this psalm. And, and I, I want to repent like David did because when David was found out, he, he did not try to fool Natan. He didn't say, oh, Natan, you're mistaken. Uh, no, I didn't do anything like that. No, no. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an innocent man. I had nothing to do with the death of Uriah. Look what he says. He says, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. So he's going to confess his transgressions he's going to ask you to blot them out. He says, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. In other words, my sin is before you. And uh, I can't keep that from happening because you see everything. You're an omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent God who sees everything. So now I'm going to confess my sin that it is not only before you, but it's before me. And against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. You know, Ananias could have said, you know, it's a terrible thing I've done to lie to the Holy Spirit. I've sinned against God. I'm, I, I really feel sorry for that. Instead, he tried to lie and evade it. And the only way that God could really show the people that he was not mocked was to allow this fatality. It says, against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be vindicated or, or blameless or justified when thou speakest and be clear, be blameless when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. I was a sinner from conception. I was brought forth in iniquity. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. So, my secret part, my inner part, must not be a place where I put God to the test.
because God is not mocked and I, I, there will be consequences for me. I can't put God to the test. Sapphira found that out and Ananias found that out. Purge me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy thy, thy free thy free spirit, thy generous spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways. In other words, I will not talk to other people until I've gotten right with God myself. Because if I don't get right with God myself and then I teach transgressors thy ways, I'm a hypocrite and I will be found out to be a hypocrite. And sinners shall be converted unto thee, O God. We ask that sinners be converted unto you tonight, Lord. I'm confessing my sins. I'm getting straight with God. I'm trying to do what David did, what Sapphira and Ananias did not do, what Achan didn't do. And I'm asking you, Lord, to convert sinners. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O oh God. And here he must be thinking about the blood of Uriah, the husband of the woman he took, breaking all of the commandments. O oh God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O oh Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice else would I give it. Thou, desire, thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Lord, give me a broken and contrite heart. Give everyone listening to this video a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, thou wilt not despise a broken and contrite heart. So, Lord, we confess that we have a duplicitous sin nature, that we were shaped in iniquity and in sin did our mother conceive us, and that the fall of Adam is also our own fall. Because verse 5 says, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive us. This, this is, we're talking about a sin nature. Everyone possesses it. Everyone who is a son of Adam. And this sin nature influences us to sin. It's the source of all lust and all sin. And he's confessing this and his blood guiltiness regarding Uriah, that he would lust for some other man's wife and then kill the man and then lie about it and then deceive everyone and break all of the commandments. Thou shalt not cover, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not steal. He's, he broke them all and he dishonored God. But when the prophet confronted him, he did not do what Ananias and Sapphira did. He repented and that's what I'm asking for you to do, friend, tonight. Repent. And that's what I'm asking for. And you know, repentance is a gift. And we don't want to repent and then fall back and repent and then fall back. We, we want to repent for seriously from our hearts. 
and be very sorry, sorry about our sins and have a broken and contrite heart about our sins. And we want our heart to be turned to you, Lord, and away from our sins. And we want the Holy Spirit to put to death this wicked thing in our hearts. We want to give you all the praise. Lord, I'm asking you for the sake of this Yiddish Hasidic Brit Hadashah that's on the screen to help me be a clean vessel fit for the master's use. And if this evening hour of revival doesn't revive anybody but me, it'll be worth it. If this, if this doesn't help anybody but me, it will be worth it. Because I cannot do this holy work unless God gives me the repentance and the holy fear that I need to do this work in the fear of God. We thank you for this, Lord, and we praise you for this. And we give all the glory to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob.